This video is sponsored by Wildlife Command Center Coffee. More about them at the end of the video. Hey everybody, it's me, John Ward, and I am back, 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 uh, with another Dark Park Film Reviews, and this is part two of the Stephen King collection that I own. Um, the last video that we, uh, that we had was just looking at individual films like Dark Tower uh, that I own. The, this next one is going to be like uh, multiple copies or a series or something like that. And uh, I think that there's some good stuff in here. So thank you for joining me on, uh, on video two. And uh, I think these are it's interesting. I, I just did not realize how many Stephen King films I own, um, but I need to own more. So that's, that's just how it is. But uh, yeah, if you haven't seen the first one, check that one out and then uh, check this one out. We have one more Stephen King video to do and then I'll, uh, I'll think of something else. And with some of these, uh, there will be videos that will be the kind of like review and rankings. So, you know, films that have Children of the Corn, that have a bunch of films, um, I'll talk about them here, but I'm going to do like an actual review and ranking uh, sometime later. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's how it is. Still here in my kitchen, kind of digging the kitchen. I don't know, I kind of like it. So I, I think I'm going to probably stay here for a while um, until I can think of something better. But I don't know, I kind of, for a kitchen, I kind of like it. I don't know, at least it's clean kind of forces me to keep it clean if it's, you know, being shown. So um, if you think it's gross, I'm sorry. This is the way it is. And uh, today's, uh, today's coffee mug is actually a large coffee mug, which has a whole bunch of different things or symbols from different movies. And they all have a number. This is a coffee mug from my cousin, uh, Chrissy. And she sent it to me for my birthday. And um, I don't think it, oh, it's on the bottom. So if you, if you can see there, that, that's where all the answers are. Some of them are, are kind of easy to figure out. Like you're just supposed to look at it. Like uh, here is the, if you can see it, you know, that's obvious alien. You know, so some, some of these are, are easy, but some of them are not. Uh, there's, you know, of course, Indiana Jones. So it's kind of like a, like a game, like a little guessing game for a coffee mug. Oh, look, there's, there's Ghostbusters right there. Obviously, uh, next to that is Star Wars. So, yeah. So it's, it's a fun mug. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy, for sending this to me. Long time ago. But I'm, I'm now using it more because it's fun. So. Uh, I really like coffee mugs, as you can tell. So uh, the first film that we're going to take a look at is, well, technically it's based off of one book, but there's been multiple movies made. And I think it is probably the one that I own, as far as a single film goes, the most. And um, kind of by accident, but also kind of not by accident. So the first thing we'll look at here, and this is from uh, Scream Factory, and this is their collector's edition of Carrie. And that's got a really nice, nice cover on it there. I like that. This is, you know, obviously near the end of the film. I really like the colors. I like what they did with it. Um, it says, uh, if only they knew she had the power. Well, they do by the end of the movie. Um, and then there's like the high school on fire. This is the car that's going to hit her, you know, near the end. And then she, of course, destroys the car and stuff like that. Um, so it's a good, it's a good cover. It's one of my favorite uh, Stephen King films. This is the original Brian Di with, you know, directed by Brian De Palma and star starring, um, uh, you know, Sissy Spacek. And of course, it also has John Travolta, and Nancy Allen. It's got a whole bunch of people in this. Um, that were kind of starting out their careers or kind of not exactly at the beginning of their careers, but the, it, it definitely made them more of a household name. Um, 
there's the side. And then we got the back. A lot of special features. So this is a, it's a two disc. So you can see there. And um, there is a review on top that says, and all stops out scare show, Los Angeles Times. And then we got, here's the, the picture of her at the prom with the pig's blood all over and there's William Cat dead on the ground. Um, a lot of text on this here. And it's, it's interesting that they just put the one picture. Um, and let's see here. So this is, yeah, so it's, it's done through Scream Factory, but it's actually MGM is the company that originally released it. It is rated R. And it originally came out in 1976, uh, while this version came out in 2016. Uh, special features you get on disc one. I'm not going to read every single one, but we'll just kind of scan through it. So disc one is a new 4K scan of the original negative, theatrical trailer, and Carrie franchise trailer gallery. So I'm wondering if they, if they show everything. All the, all the stuff, you know, all the remakes, sequels, and all that stuff. Um, disc two, new interviews with writer Lawrence D. Cohen. Uh, we got an, uh, let's see, the editor, a um, couple of the actors. Looks like oh, a few of the actors, casting director. Director of Photography, Composer. And I like this thing that Screen Factory does is whenever something is new that they're adding to it, they say new. So you know it's, it's for this. Some of the other stuff could be older off of other releases, but they always like to do new interviews and behind the scenes and stuff. So they, and they always tell you what's new. Um, you get... Uh, New Horrors, Hollowed Grounds, revisiting the film's original locations, acting of Carrie, which is a, um, an interview with the actors. Um, yeah, there's a ton of stuff on this. Visualizing Carrie, interviews with Brian De Palma and a bunch of other people, looking at the Carrie musical. That's that you can find like some of that stuff on YouTube, like the actual musical or at least the other you know, uh, uh, performances of it. It may not be the original. I, I think the original is out there, but you got to look for it. <clears throat> uh, TV spots, radio spots, still gallery, rare behind the scenes photos, Stephen King and the evolution of Carrie text gallery. So, and Lawrence B. Cohen, who's the screenwriter of this, he did go on to, I think he also wrote it, the original it. He's done, a, he's done other things too. Um, so it does have a slip jacket and this is, since this, when you originally got it, you could actually get a separate slip jacket. It came with two. So this is the other one. And you can actually see its side right here. And, oh, that's interesting. The back is, so we got Carrie walking home at the end. Um, there's the car that's like from the, the beginning of this that has uh, John Travolta and Nancy Allen in it. Uh, then we have Carrie with her mom, Pepper Laurie. And um, then we have, and I'm, I'm blanking on her name for a second here. Uh, come on, John. Not PJ Souls. Blanking on her name. Blanking on her name, but I'm going to get it in a second here. Amy Irving. Amy Irving. Then we got a picture of Amy Irving here. Interesting that this is all black and they just, you know, like they didn't put the credits or anything on here. Um, some of this could have fit onto this. But um, it's nice that they give you a, a second jacket. Um, they did it with John Carpenter's The Thing also. So that's kind of cool. Um, so let's take this off. 
And let's see if the inside. So yeah, so they're the same. And let's see what it has to say here. So uh, based on the best-selling Stephen King novel, this absolutely spellbinding horror movie, Roger Ebert, has become a persuasive pop culture touchstone for anyone who's ever wanted to get even. Sissy Spacek and Piper Laurie uh, deliver Oscar-nominated performances, and John Travolta and Amy Irving are terrific in this ultra-revenge fantasy that has become one of the all-time great horror classics and is now finally offered as a definitive two-disc collector's edition Blu-ray. Still the best version of the movie, even though they've had the remakes and the sequels. Still the best. One of Brian De Palma's best movies, too, especially with the split screens and all that type of stuff. He just knew what he was doing. And he was the only one out of all these other ones that had enough balls to actually show the girls naked at the beginning in the shower, even though they're supposed to be high school students. So they're obviously older than 18. And uh, but at, when this was originally done, uh, which was 1976, you could get away with that. Uh, today, you can't. Um, it makes it much more realistic if you see that type of stuff. And I would even say that for like a guy's locker room. You know, if you're in a men's locker room, show some of the guys naked. That because guys are naked in locker rooms, women are naked in locker rooms. So it, it's just weird that everybody would wear like a towel or something like that. So it just doesn't, I don't know. This did not do that. So I, I appreciate that. Um, at the center of terror is Carrie Spacek, a high school loner. I'm going to sneeze in a second. Could be, <coughs> excuse me. Might be two. Might be two. Uh, is a high school loner with no confidence and no friends, dot, 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 um, and no idea about the extent of her powers of telekinesis. But when her psychotic mother and sadistic classmates finally go too far, the once shy teen becomes an under-restrained, under vengeance-seeking powerhouse who with the help of her special gift, causes all hell to break loose in a famed cinematic frenzy of blood, fire, and brimstone. And it says here, 1976, best actress in leading role, Sissy Spacek, best actress in a supporting role was uh, Piper Laurie. So this is, a, this is a really good Blu-ray. It's got a lot of great stuff on it. Um, so let's take a look inside. It's a little dusty. Okay, so they also got the original poster in here, and I like what they did with this. So this looks good. So you have the feature film here and the special editions uh, or special features over here. So this is nice. You know, you got Piper Laurie on one side, you got John Travolta on the other side. So this looks good. This is nice. And then um, you can flip it. And it has the original, stay, the original poster on the front. Kind of gives away the ending of the movie, but I guess if you've read the book, which is different from the movie. So it's in a way kind of like Jaws where, where the book and the movie are similar they're pretty close, but they're, there's still a ton of differences, and this is the same, the same thing. Um, in the book, Carrie, uh, well, Stephen King has said that it's actually a combination of two girls that he went to school with. And so in the book, Carrie is actually short, really overweight, greasy, like skin and hair. She has pimples everywhere. She's just really unpleasant. And um, nobody likes her. She's just a really kind of unpleasant person. And I don't think Sissy Spacek is that. She might, you know, she's not a supermodel, but I, I don't think that she's, you know, she's awful looking. But I think this is probably out of all the actresses to play Carrie. Um, she's still the best representation of the book. So, but I, I don't know if you could even today, because they tried it, make Carrie and have her, the, like she is in the book. I don't, I don't think that you could do that. Um, 
The book is is very similar to Jaws in the way that it's done. It's interesting. You know, that carries kind of that shark. And also the way in both books, how the shark dies and then how Carrie dies are, are very much kind of the same thing. Um, I, I recommend reading both of those books if you haven't and you like the movies. So um, the next one, and like I said, these are multiple copies or series or whatever, would be the, the Carrie two-pack. So this has the, the original and the new version. And Carrie two-pack, so there's both Carries there. And um, I like the cover because it does show both of them. It's interesting that they could get both of them so so close. I mean, I don't think you're, I mean, these, I don't think these are doctored. So it, it's interesting that they were able to find two pictures that matched. I could be wrong, but it doesn't look like it's doctored. And then there's the side. And it says, yeah, this is the MGM two-pack carry 1976 original and a 2013 new release. Um, I wanted the um, I wanted the new version, and I thought, oh, why not just get it with with the original? Even though I already have it, might as well just get it. So I bought it used, so it was fine by me. <clears throat> um, oh wow, this is this is tiny. So which carry? Watch Carrie unleash her wrath in this bloody double pack. And so it's Carrie, the original 1976 tale of terror. Writing is really tight. See, once again, because the light's on it, it looks like it's bright, but it's not. And the red on the black is nice, but it's it's doesn't help. Um, it says, for the original Carrie, all hell breaks loose when tormented, misfit teenager Oscar winner Sissy Spacek unleashes her secret telekinetic powers against her psychotic mother, Piper Laurie, and sadistic classmates. And yes, a 76 color, 98 minutes widescreen. Yeah, this one is also widescreen. English subtitles, 1976, plus or minus 98 minutes. Uh, uh, DTS HD master audio, it's the 5.1 and mono. And then the yeah, rated R, and then it just gives like the credits here. So now for the new one, so I like that it's, so you have De Palma, who directed the original, man, obviously. Great director, comes from the school of Alfred Hitchcock. Then you have the director of the new one, who is Kimberly Pierce. I do appreciate a woman directing this, since it is a, you know, a coming of age film. Um, I think a woman would obviously know more than a man, which is probably why we don't get the nudity at the beginning in the shower, um, because it is a woman directing it um, as opposed to a man directing it. Um, so I guess I can appreciate both for their own way. I'm kind of making my own assumptions about things. Um, it is, so based on the book by Stephen King, Does say screenplay by Lawrence D. Cohen and Roberto uh, um, Agari Sakaza? Sakaza? So I don't know if they, if Lawrence D. Cohen actually wrote this. Oh, no, you, you know what they probably did? They took his screenplay, Lawrence D. Cohen's screenplay, and then they had this Roberto um, Agari Sag Aza write his script based off of the original screenplay. That's what I would have to assume because there, there is the word and, and that means that they wrote it separately. 
Um, the film is rated R. And so I want, because I'm dyslexic, I always get her, her, her names reversed. So this is my problem. My big problem with this. Chloe Grace Moretz is horribly miscast. Horribly. She does a good job. I like her as an actress. Um, but this is not Carrie. So if Sissy Spacek is, out of all the films, the best representation, then Chloe, uh, like I said, I always have problems. Chloe Grace Moretz would be probably the worst. And I say that because, and like I said, I think she's a good actress. I have absolutely nothing against her. Um, but she's too good looking. Just, it's that simple. Um, you know, she's a beautiful young woman and she's playing this total misfit. And when I was watching this, I'm like, because I saw this in the theater, um, I'm like, why wouldn't the girls be friends with her? You know, this would almost kind of be like Heather's and uh, where they would, or even like Clueless, you, you know, where they, they take kind of the ugly duckling and make her beautiful type of thing. And um, I always thought that's what they would have done with Carrie in this, um, that they would, because she is good looking, that they would want to make her less of a threat and they would make her one of their own. You know, she doesn't look like the book or Sissy Spacek. So I always thought that she was miscast, even though I think that she does a good job. Um, and that, that's my problem is whenever they seem to be casting Carrie or a Carrie-like character, the actresses are too good looking. And, and I don't know if it's just the studios not wanting to cast somebody from the book. And uh, maybe they think that it's just not going to be a good rep representation of somebody who's overweight. I, I don't know. But I, I would like to actually see the carry from the book. Or maybe it could be that the carry from the book is, is just very unlikable. I mean, she's, she is kind of unlikable. And so um, maybe that's why they go with somebody, you know, that's better looking than what the book is. But I did, I, I do like her. I thought that she did a good job. You know, I just think that she's just too, she's too good looking for the part. Um, I mean, I think that kind of like in the Neighbors 2, where she plays like the mean sorority girl, that fit her perfectly, absolutely perfectly. Um, she was in a film called uh, Shadow in the Clouds or Shadow in the Cloud. I might be adding an S, um, which I thought that she was really good in too. I thought that she was, you know, all takes place on an airplane. And um, I thought that she did a great job in that. So it's nothing against her. It's just, I just don't think that she got casted correctly. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. There is a director's cut of the new version that the director has been trying to get out there for a long time. And just the studio... MGM just won't release it. I would love to see it because the cut that's on here, the one that I saw in the theater, is just a remake of this. It's just a straightforward remake. I mean, there's really no difference. There is an updating of it to include cell phones and things like that. Um, I do like that when Carrie is having her period in the shower and the girls, you know, the throwing the, the tampons and stuff at her, that people are recording it on their phone. And then the mean girl... Uh, puts it up on like YouTube for people to see. And there's a whole thing about the gym teacher talking to her dad saying, okay, well then the mean girl can go to prom if she shows us her phone and that video is not on it. I like that. Um, that's obviously something that's not in the book because uh, since the book was written in like 75, you know, somewhere right in there, 76, 75. And uh, yeah, it might be 74 even. And um, I like that they updated it that way. So it does have good things in it, but it just, I think it could have been meaner. I mean, this is not a nice movie. Um, and I think as far as getting a message across about bullying, I think that they could have made this meaner. I think that the carry could have been meaner. Um, but uh, so let's, because who else is, is in this? So 
Yeah, Judy Greer, who I love, um, plays the the uh, the coach, the girls' coach. Julianne Moore plays the mom. She's great in this. Not as she's, I think she's great, but Piper Laurie is just from the original is just dead on. But she does a great job trying to measure up to Piper Laurie. Um, the The person who does the the soundtrack is really good. They have um, yeah, is uh, I always mispronounce his name. Uh, Pino. Why do I have to find it? Here. but he does a lot of um the early why isn't his name in the credits you think that music would be important and of course i'm blanking on it well, he did, um, as I'm sure one of you will mention something in the comments, but Pino, uh, uh, um, last name starts with a D. I'm always having a hard time pronouncing it, but he, uh, he has stuff like Piranha and he's done things like Dress to Kill for De Palma and all that type of stuff. So the, which is, so it's a great soundtrack. Um, and he's just a great like composer, conductor of the music. Um, and then the person who does it for the, the new version is uh, Marco Bellatrani. And I um, believe he's the guy who did um, Scream, one through four, I think. Um, he did Terminator 3, which has a pretty good soundtrack to it, you know, Rise of the Machines. Um, don't quote me on, on him doing Scream. I'm pretty sure he did Scream. Uh, so let's see uh, if I can read this for her. So, okay, so... Chloe Grace Moretz and Oscar nominee Julianne Moore star in this um, exhilarating reimagining of Stephen King's iconic bestseller. Carrie is more terrifying than ever in this powerful, powerful pulse quickening horror story. And let's see the special. God. Special features, maybe if I take it out of the box. Oh, since I have it open, so here's the, here's the inside. So there's the, yeah, the original carry is there. And then the remake is there. So it's nice with this carry here that it's white. They got kind of carry, kind of like, like finger paint written out. And it's a different picture of Sissy Spacek. This is just this so why not find a different picture of of hers carrie and put it on like they did with this creative on this side not creative on this side even has the same red so but i'm glad that at least that they're different it just doesn't simply say carrie okay so let's see because i think there were some scratches uh special features alternate ending not shown in theater Deleted alternate scenes, creating carry, the power of telekinesis, commentary by director Kimberly Pierce, telekinetic coffee shop surprise. Oh, that's like a prank that people play. Uh, 2013 color, 100 minutes, widescreen. Uh, And it just talks about its all of its different versions of, of sound, like surround and Dolby and all that type of stuff. Um, anybody else? Let's... So. Yeah, so that's pretty much that one, but it is bugging me. I am going to because these are things I should know.
completely did not type in what I just typed. Looking up Dress to Kill, 1980. Okay, so yeah, Pino, and I always pronounce his last name wrong. Uh, uh, it's Italian. I should know it. I'm Italian. Uh, Pino Don Goro, Donna Gorai. Pino Donna Goro. I know I'm mispronouncing it, but sorry. But that's yeah, that's who who did the music in the first film. Okay, so now the second one, or third one, actually, this one has three films in it, and we're still on Carrie. Um, this is one that I picked up because I wanted to get the Rage Carrie 2, and I figured, what the hell? This one has even another Carrie remake that I did not have. So, Carrie, three film collection. So you get the original. So I now have that three times. The Rage Carrie 2, and Carrie... 2002, which was the TV miniseries that was on. Uh, that until the ending was the closest thing to the book. Um, Carrie 2002, which I think ran three hours on commercial television, uh, was a pilot for a TV series based on Carrie, where Carrie and... Um, uh, God, what is her friend's name? The one that, uh, I'm gonna have to look that up. It's, this is the problem with age, man. Sue, Sue, uh, Sue Snell. Um, at the end of this, um, after Carrie destroys everything, like the high school and all that stuff, Carrie and Sue drive to another town and they start life again. And they were going to uh, make, a, make a TV series out of it. And it never happened. So, um, hmm, is that? Yeah, so this, pulled it correctly. It's the same picture as that. Okay. So, all right. They just use the same photos. Um, it also has the white box that I liked, you know, like the clear box. Uh, here's the side. So this is once again, MGM. Um, I did enjoy the Rage Carry 2. Completely unnecessary film. And um, uh, Amy Irving is back in Carry 2 and dies really poorly. Kind of sucks that they killed off her character that way or killed her off at all. I mean, so if they wanted to make a carry three, you know, the raging, the ragest, rage hard, carry three. But um, then here we have a little carry down there again. There we go. And we got the back. So we got picture of the original carry, which... Yeah, it's the picture from the with the pig blood on her. And then we have the credits for all three films. Um, so let's see if there's anything on these. So the original carry, as we know, is rated R, 1976 color, 98 minutes, widescreen. Then it goes through all of its sound, subtitles. Uh, the Rage Carry 2. Not releasing any sort of special features on these. Uh, Carrie 2 rated R. That is directed by uh, Kat Shea, um, who worked for Roger Corman for a while. She did a Strip to Kill, Strip to Kill 2, and some other film. Uh, Poison Ivy. She did the first Poison Ivy. Um, and uh, once again, glad a, a, I have no problem. I actually like that they got her to do this because she is kind of from that uh, low budget world where 
it makes sense for somebody like this to direct a carry sequel. And um, once again, with just mostly dealing with young women, it's probably best to have a woman direct it. Um, so I, I actually like that. So we have, you know, like two carry films that are directed by women and two carry films that are directed by men. Um, who else is in this? So we got, uh, so Emily Burgle, I think it's Burgle, is she is, her name is Rose in this, I think. Uh, you also have Jason London. Amy Irving is in this. And um, they don't list her, but you know, I keep looking stuff up, but it's frustrating me that I can't remember people's names. Um, from American Pie. If my fingers weren't so fat, this could be done quicker. Or if I just said it. My God. I know how to spell, but man, my fingers like to hit other. American Pie. So her best friend is played by. Oh, yeah. So Minna Savari plays her best friend in it. So you have some known people in this. Um, like I said, that's rated R. Soundtrack on it is pretty good, too. A lot of kind of like punk stuff. And then Carrie 2002 came out in 2002. It's 132 minutes because it was a miniseries. It's full frame, not widescreen because it was made for television. And then we get into the the sound and the subtitles. Um, it is directed by David Carson. So there's our, our second guy. Uh, Brian Fuller. So both David Carson and Brian Fuller were Star Trek guys. Like Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, who else is in this? So uh, Angelina uh, Betis is in this. Patricia Clarkson plays the mom. She does a good job. Uh, And David Keith, I think he plays, he plays a cop, he plays a detective. So, and this is not rated. Uh, this collection looks like it came out in, I'm not seeing. Carry 2 came out in 99, but I didn't mention that. Why aren't there dates on these things? This does not have a date on when it came out. I have no idea when this came out. Obviously, after 2002, let's take a look inside. Now, that's this flat out board. Wait, what? Yeah, you know, all they did was, you know, guys, come on. Come on. Really? So dumb. All right, well, that's our carry disc. So at least they're separate discs. I'll give them that. Um, ooh, that's nice and exciting. Nothing. Um, side A is widescreen, side A is standard, or side, side A is widescreen, side B is standard. So one is widescreen, one is standard, is full frame. So you can't really put a picture on that. So, and then this is the new carry, which is just, I mean, just even the font is boring. Like, come on, man. Look at that. Carry. That's interesting. Yeah, I can't figure, I don't know when this came out. And this I'm not gonna look up. So it will give me other editions that I probably, weird that there's no date on it. And it does talk, talk about a copyright or trademark. Okay. All right, so we're done with carry. That's all a carry. So that's how many carries? 
So one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six versions of carry. Okay, now the next one, if you don't like this film, you're crazy. Absolutely crazy. This is one of the greatest bad movies ever made. It is the only film that Stephen King has ever directed. I love this movie. Um, it is so batshit crazy and um, kind of, in a way, follows the short story. But uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I have the soundtrack. I have like two versions of the soundtrack. And, and uh, I want to get that poster of Stephen King, you know, coming through like the, like the middle of the truck and he's like doing the, the puppet master thing. I want that poster. Um, so it is, if you haven't figured it out already, Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive. My reason for having this actually on DVD instead of picking up the Blu-ray is that it's not uncut. So if the Blu-ray was uncut, I would pick it up. Or if I could find it for cheap, I'd probably pick it up. But this was heavily censored when it came out to get the R rating. And um, I'm just not going to spend money on the Blu-ray if it's not going to be the uncut version. Um, I do like that cover. It's a pretty funny cover. It's got the, the person's all embedded in the truck there. Um, it does say who made who? Made who? Question mark. Um, yeah, it's a good looking cover. I like that. I dig it. Great title too, Maximum Overdrive. The original title of the short story is Trucks. I believe it's in uh, Night Shift. There's our side. And uh, we got the, uh, got our Green Goblin up there with the truck right there. And this is through um, Anchor Bay. Um, here's our back. Here we have uh, Emilio Estevez just to, uh, Hanging out by the by the head truck there, by the lead truck with the uh, green goblin head on it. Here's our our the Dixie Boy truck stop. That's where most of our movie takes place. Um, it says, "Get ready for maximum carnage." Written and directed by Stephen King, with music by ACDC. Yes, it does. They even do some instrumental pieces in it too. Brand new song, "Who Made Who." And then some older songs were thrown in. Um, I even like that they just don't write Maximum Overdrive, that they actually put this right down here in the credits. I like that. So it's yeah, somebody being a little creative. Um, film by Stephen, a film by Stephen King. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Written for the screen and directed by Stephen King. Uh, music by ACDC. You know, Emilio Estevez, Pat Hingle, Laura Harrington, Christopher Mur uh, Murney. And we have the Anchor Bay. There's their website. This is color, 98 minutes rated R. Be nice to get an uncut version of this one day, but I've been told that footage does not exist anymore. Um, special features are widescreen presentation. Um, that It's the 2.35 to 1 enhanced for 16 by nine TVs, theatrical trailer, and Stephen King bio. Uh, the writing is very tiny, so let's see. Uh, oh, there's the Green Goblin truck again up there. They like showing it. It's a cool truck. Um, would probably never exist, but at least I don't think so. But it's cool for the movie. So let's see. When a mysterious comet passes close to Earth, Machines everywhere start to take on mysterious minds of their own. Soon, video games, cash machines, drawbridges, and steamrollers all go on a psychotic killing spree of global uh, rebellion. But when the Dixie Boy truck stop is held hostage by a mob of homicidal 18-wheelers, human vengeance goes into overdrive. Who made who? And who will survive the final showdown of man versus bloodthirsty machine? Question mark. Emilio Estevez stars in this outrageous, that's for true, that's true, uh, twisted metal epic that marked the, the directing debut 
of mass of horror master Stephen King and features a head banging score of classic hits and original music by ACDC. So this is actually a big influence. I made a short film called Skull Evil, and this was a big influence on Skull Evil. So um, that's why I love it so much. I had to had to kind of do my, it's not a, it's not even, I see the two films don't have a lot to do with one another, except that this was just kind of like a, a spiritual thing for when I made the movie. So let's take a look inside. Ah, there's the poster and it's got a good disc. So if there's anything, okay, there is. So here it is. I'm very happy with that. Look at that. There's the original poster. I want that poster. I want to hang it up. And it says uh, Stephen King's masterpiece of terror directed by the master himself. I think these days he would disagree with you on that one. And then we got the, got a good looking disc right there. So we got that cool font with the title. We got the green goblin on the front there. This is good stuff. So yeah, this is good. Closing right. Oh, and then there was a thing on the back. Oh, chapter selections. And that looks like King himself. I'm guessing this is behind the scenes because that's King, but then the actress is really smiling. I'm guessing, yeah, this has got to be behind the scenes. Like he's showing her how to do something and she's smiling while he's doing it. I don't think that's in the movie. Okay. So now the next one is a film that follows uh, the short story much closer. Um, I, I really like it. And it is called Trucks. And I believe this was made for television. Um, you Turn, You Die. And it has Timothy Busfield in it. Trucks. Uh, based on a short story by Stephen King. So I'm not sure what this was. Maybe it will say on the back, but uh, it's released through Lionsgate. But at the time, I think it was something like, I don't think it was Sci-Fi Channel when this came out. I think it was um, like USA or one of those channels had it. But it's a good cover. I like the cover. I like it with the skeleton driving the truck. And then, oops, side. Yeah, and it's, yeah, Lionsgate is up there. And it's based on the story by Stephen King. So it says, trucks based on the story by Stephen King, based on the short story by the master of terror, Stephen King, done in yellow. Trucks, uppercase, is a chilling tale of technology turned evil. Um, in, in the infamous Area 51 zone, uh, renowned for its UFO sightings, residents of a small town are cut off from civilization and held hostage when a mysterious convoy of driverless trucks goes on a rampage, wreaking havoc on its inhabitants in this close encounter of the machine kind. See what they did there? Close encounter of the machine kind. I don't believe in the short story this has anything to do with Area 51 or UFOs. It just happens. Um, there we have, uh, that looks like yeah, Timothy Busfeld right there. And um, this is a pretty woman right there. I don't know who that is. That's uh, it just lists Timothy as an actor. You got the chapters. Special features are boring. It's it's a letterbox, Dolby surround, stereo, interactive menus, scene, access, Spanish subtitles, trailer, and English closed caption. Boring. Does have the Lionsgate website. Uh, the screenplay is by Brian Taggart. And it is directed by Chris uh, Thompson. Got that here and here. Uh, horror, 95 minutes. Mm. 
So five, six, seven, eight. So this might have been going off the Roman numerals. Um, five, six, seven, eight. 98, maybe, is when this came out. Do I'm reading that correctly? I do more Roman numerals down here. Just give an actual date. Stop with the Roman numerals. It's not a Friday the 13th film. Um, anybody in the credits that I would recognize? No. Okay, well, let's... Okay. I like that the DVD has a different truck on it and it's got different font. A high speed thriller with no brakes. So there you go. At least it's not just that again, which is a good cover, but it's different at least. So I recommend trucks. I think people should see it. I thought it was good. All right, so that ends the that part. So the, that's those two films. Now, the next two films are also based off of Stephen King's short stories, surprisingly. And this one, Stephen King had his name removed everywhere from it. He did not want to take part in this movie at all, um, except for the title and somebody lawn mowing. It has nothing to do with the short story at all, um, which I could be wrong, but I think it's also Night Shift. Um, and uh, if you couldn't figure it out already, it is the Lawnmower Man. Um, this is the theatrical version, so it's the cut version. There is a longer, over two hour version, which I plan on picking up, but I just wanted to, to have it. So, um, this is the new platinum, the new line platinum series, uh, Lawnmower Man, starring Jeff A. and uh, Pierce Brosnan. Uh, Jeff Fahey is the lawnmower man. Pierce Brosnan is the doctor. Um, it says, one of the hottest science fiction films, dot, dot, dot. It will blow your mind. Uh, there is no quotes around this. This is, I, I don't know who said this. Somebody said this. Somebody at the studio and marketing said this. Um, so there, there, that's Job, and he's pushing a lawnmower. And then that's Job again, once he kind of gets all into the whole lawnmower man computer world this is really old you could tell from this this box too this they don't make these anymore um and then there's its side not the most thrilling cover um it's back so there's pierce and it says uh animated interactive menus so it shows what that looks like, I guess, there and there. Uh, there is Job, once he gets all kind of computerized. Nothing to do with the short story. Nothing. Um, Brett Leonard wrote the screenplay and he directed this. Um, he did a few other films, too. Um, he just kind of disappeared. It was kind of a thing for about 10 minutes. Clive Turner who worked on some of the Howling movies, is one of the producers on this. Um, Jenny Wright, the beautiful Jenny Wright, is in this. She has kind of disappeared, too. Uh, Joffrey Lewis is in this. Juliette Lewis's dad. Um, he is also in uh, Salem's Lot, the TV version of Salem's Lot. Uh, 1992. Looks like this came out in 1997. It is widescreen, rated R. Uh, trying to see a running time. I think it's like, oh, here it is. Approximate, uh, running time approximately 108 minutes. So it's more than just a movie. The con, move, more than just a movie. Um, the contents of this disc include, so let's quickly go through this, widescreen version convert, converted from the new high-definition transfer of the film, um, audio commentary with director Brett Leonard and producer 
Gimel Everett. Gimel, yeah, Gimel Everett. Uh, 12 deleted scenes. That makes your director's cut of this. Um, On-screen interviews with the stars. Star highlights showcasing separate clips from three other movies. Okay. Um, edited animated sequences with original music. Storyboard comparison. So was there a different soundtrack to this? Which is why they're saying with the original music. Uh, storyboard comparison. Um, original theatrical trailer. Cast biographies and filmographies. Dolby Digital, multi-channel, surround sound, and more. Uh, let's find out what this is about. In this sci-fi thriller, The Lawnmower Man, Pierce Brosnan, GoldenEye, Livewire, plays Dr. Lawrence um, Angelo. Yeah, Angelo. A brilliant scientist obsessed with perfecting a revolutionary virtual reality computer software. Nothing to do with the short story. Uh, when his experiments on animals fail, he finds a ideal substitute, Job Smith, Jeff A. He body parts, a slow-witted gardener, the lawnmower man, and Angelo's goal is to benefit his human guinea pig and ultimately mankind itself. But evil lurks, dot, 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 in the disguise of the shop. That is a regular Stephen King thing. The shop is in many Stephen King movies and books. Um, a shadowy group that seeks to use the technology to create an invincible war machine. Sounds like the shop. Um, when the experiments change the simple lawnmower man into a superhuman being, uh, the stage is set for a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde struggle for the controls of Job's mind and the future of the world. So let's take a look. Okay, here's our... In and this disc is... So there's nothing on it because it looks like we have widescreen on one side, full, full screen on the other. Um, here you have Job, I guess all kind of... I don't know, computerized out, lawnmower man out, like the super machine guy, but he still has his lawnmower. Got to keep your friend. Um, there's both Pierce and Jeff Fahey. This is really bad. Obviously, their heads are just put on these bodies. This is so poorly done. Um, this is Job having sex with somebody inside the computer. And then there's Job getting all, all mad in the computer. Um, side one has star highlights featuring Pierce Brosnan and oh okay so it is clips from other movies that New Line has made so side one has star highlights featuring Pierce Brosnan and clips from Livewire, Detonator and Detonator 2 full motion chapter index with special play preview features and then it goes into the, the different chapters here Side two, 12 deleted scenes. And then these are all the deleted scenes down here. Uh, doing right by DVD. There's a little thing down here. Um, care tips. Okay, well, let's learn how to take care of this because there are some fingerprints on here that are not mine. So, because I bought this used. Um, care tips. Handle disc carefully. Making contact only with the center hole and edge. To remove disc from case, Press the push button on the center hub and press downward. Using your other hand, gently remove disc by its outer edge. Never remove the disc solely by prying its outer edge. Do not touch disc surface. Do not stack disc because they will scratch. Uh, make sure disc is properly seated inside player before closing door. Access the Lawnmower Man special features by pressing the menu key on your DVD player, remote control. 
So, man, th this came out in early DVD days where they had to explain, like, literally everything uh, to people. And probably rightly so. They probably would just take the disc out with their hand and just throw it in and be like, why is it all fucked up? Because you mistreated it. The next one, obviously, is one of the worst movies ever made. Lawnmower Man 2, Job's War, or Lawnmower Man 2, Cyberspace. Beyond Cyberspace is the full title. Um, there is our Lawnmower Man again, who is not the same actor that this Lawnmower Man is. Still got the church down there. And it says, God made him simple. Science made him a god. Now he wants revenge. It's a little, I don't know, it's kind of the same, same thing. So as the covers go. Um, we got the city in the background. So everybody says Highlander 2 is one of the worst sequels ever made. That's one of the worst films ever made. It doesn't make sense or anything. Um, there's <coughs> four different versions of Highlander 2. So they have tried. Um, I own three of the four. And my favorite out of those is still the theatrical version that is actually not released. It's only available on VHS. So I had to buy a VHS copy to get it. And unfortunately, it's the full frame. It's not widescreen like the DVDs are. Um, the, Renegade, the Renegade cut is okay. Um, and then there's like two other versions. Um, or no, maybe there's only three. There might only be three. So there's the theatrical VHS, the Renegade version. No, I think there are four. Then there's a producer's cut. The Renegade cut is the director's cut. Then there's a producer's cut. And then there's like a, um, like a British cut, like a UK version of it that has a different ending where Connor goes up into the sky and into the sun or uh, into the stars at the end. So there's four versions of those. So they tried desperately to fix that movie. I like the, the theatrical version the best. Um, I find it entertaining. This is nuts. This movie makes no sense. I mean, I don't know how or what they were thinking with this. Um, so this is, yeah, it's also New Line. And um, here's its back. Now, I mentioned this in, in the last Stephen King one. I do like when actors come back to Stephen King films, even if they're good or bad. Um, this one, of course, has... Um, uh, Matt Fuhr, you know, who's in The Stand. He's now, you know, he's in this. Um, this isn't Stephen King, but it's relatable. Is you know, He was in the remake of Dawn of the Dead. Um, and, of course, he was Max, you know, Max Hedrum. Um, I really like him, so it's great to, to see him pop back up and stuff. Uh, but this movie makes no sense. Um, it's ooh, animated menus. This is back in the day where they tried to make that a big deal. Uh, the DVD features are widescreen version of the film. You also get the full screen version of the film. Uh, you get the 5.1 surround sound, uh, the stereo surround sound. Um, English subtitles, theatrical trailer, and it is DVD-ROM enabled. Um, the director, and I've mentioned him in something else. I was trying to think of what he did. And I'm like, oh, I know that he did it. Did, you know, why am I bringing him up? And now I'm forgetting. I, can't, I, I think it was in the, uh, in the last Dollar Tree video that I brought him up. And I could not think of it. But this is the movie that I was thinking of. Um, so that is, um, I'm going to mispronounce it, and it's very tiny, um, Farhad Man. Um, he also wrote the screenplay. He also he did the story. Let's see if he's listed anywhere else in this. I was amazed by this while I was watching it. I even think I did a post. Clive Turner is, is on this as one of the producers. Um, I think I even mentioned, like, on, on Facebook, I did a post saying, if you thought Highlander 2 was bad, try watching Lawnmower Man 2. Um, it also has uh, Patrick Bergen, who I don't think is the same doctor from this one that, Lan that uh, Pierce plays. I think he's a different guy. Um, 
Austin O'Brien, who a lot of people know from Prehysteria, he is god awful in this. He is horrible. He is at that age in this that he is just horrible, horrible. Um, and Kevin Con uh, Kevin Conway. So let's see. So here we have. So it looks like they took this, this picture and put it right here, but just made like the female a different color. I don't remember if this scene is in the movie. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but they just took a picture from Lawn Mower Man. Um, I can't make out what that is, but that might be Matt Fuhrer and one of the doctors, possibly. And same type of thing down here. I think that's Matt Fuhrer and like a doctor. Might be Patrick Bergen. I'm not sure. Uh, this is PG-13. The other one was rated R. Uh, this is, it's PG-13. Parents are strongly cautioned. Uh, for sci-fi, action, violence, and brief language. Supplemental material, not rated. Yeah, Turner Home Video. Running time is 93 minutes. Mm. Damn, them and their Roman numerals. All right, so... Yeah, I can't. So B is five. 96? I could be right. This is 92. This might be 96 if I'm reading the Roman numeral correctly. I could look it up, but I'm not going to bother. Uh, okay, so let's, let's find out what this sequel is about, because I know that we've all been waiting for Lawn Mower Man 2, Job's War. Or Job's War, as some people would say. Lawn Mower Man 2, let's go watch Lawn Mower Man 2, Job's War. Um, enter the deadly world of viral, of virtual reality, where information is the key to world domination. In this intelligent... <laughs> sci-fi thriller that picks up where the original Lawnmower Man in red um, ended, Job has become a hostage in futuristic hell. When he discovers a computer chip that will give him the key to the ultimate revenge, uh, the battle for the world begins. I thought, thought the battle for the world was in the first one also, so maybe it's the battle continues. Um, with Virtually stunning special effects, Lawnmower Man 2, Job's War in red, um, takes you into a world where only the hardwired dare to journey. Well, forget the Matrix. I'm going to watch this. Oh, okay, so we got it. Okay, so here's our. I like that picture, apparently. Okay, so we got that picture there. They use it again here. They use it again here. This is kind of funny because it does fit up, fit the whole disc, and it's funny that's right in his, his center. But man, they like using this. And then I just looked, and it's got the scene selection here. And then there's that picture that I pointed out that she's the different color. So I don't know. Maybe they do it again, but she's just a different color. Maybe they use the same footage but change it. Or they're just using this as a picture. I don't know. So. And it does give us care tips down below. But we've already gone through those. The more you know. All right. So that's Lawnmower Man 2. So now we are done with Lawnmower Man because they never made a Lawnmower Man 3. Uh, now the next one I am going to get yelled at. Um, because it is a classic. And I know it is visually awesome looking. And it's well directed and everything else. Uh, it is Stanley Kubrick, and um, 
about it's about time that they uh, called this Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, because this is not Stephen King's The Shining, and he has made that very well known. <coughs> as I pointed out, I am a Stephen King purist. I like to have stuff as close to the book as possible. Um, this is not as close to the book as possible, especially the ending. Um, I know I'm going to get raked over the, the coals for this. I think Jack Nicholson is actually miscast um, in the book. He is not crazy at the very beginning, even though he does have issues, and then he becomes crazy. Nicholson is just Nicholson. He is just crazy from, you know, from the minute the movie begins to the end. Um, that's just who Nicholson is. So I, I don't think they that Kubrick did a good job with representing the character of Jack Torrance. Um, I think that uh, Kubrick completely missed the point of the book and they were rewriting on the set the entire time. Um, I do prefer the miniseries, which is called Stephen King's The Shining and it's directed by Mick Garris. Um, I prefer that. I think that's a better version of the, you know, um, of the book, a better representation of the book. But with that being said, The Shining is a good movie all by itself. Um, I do like Nicholson, even though I do think that he's uh, miscast, kind of like the whole Carrie thing. Um, I do think he does a good job. I think everybody in this does a good job. Visually, it's beautiful looking. The directing is, you know, uh, great. Um, so it's a real kind of hit and miss thing with me. If somebody said, let's watch The Shining, I'd have no problem watching this version. Um, but I would also want the person to watch the miniseries too. Uh, this is a two disc special edition. And um, this is Warner Brothers, and they even put it on the side, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. I'm really glad that they did that. Um, and then we got the back. And it says, uh, the first epic horror film. And that is a Jack Krull, Newsweek. Um, side, so disc one is the digitally remastered movie commentary by steady cam inventor operator garrett brown and historian john baxter and you get a theatrical trailer disc two which is special features has the vivian Cor uh, kubrick's documentary the making of the shining with optional commentary that's a good documentary um i think it's also on youtube and uh three mesmerizing new features um view from the overlook Crafting the Shining, The Visions of Stanley Kubrick, and Wendy Carlos Composer. Um, so this is produced and directed by Stanley Kubrick, uh, based on the novel by Stephen King. Um, the screenplay is by Kubrick and Diane uh, Johnson. Um, on top of Jack Nicholson, obviously, you get Shelley Duvall. You also get Scatman uh, Crothers, who's awesome in this. Um, Melvin Van Peebles plays that role in the, um, in the miniseries. I prefer his performance over because I'm just a huge Peebles fan, Van Peebles fan, and Danny Lloyd. Uh, the Shining, 1980. This came out in 2007. It is widescreen. 144 minutes, color, rated R. Bonus material, trailer not rated. So let's see what it has to say. From a script he adapted from, from the Stephen King novel, director Stanley Kubrick uh, melds vivid performances, menacing settings, dreamlike tracking shots, and shock after shock into a milestone of the macabre. In a signature role, Jack Nicholson, here's Johnny. It says it right there. Doesn't give a movie he's in. It just says, here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. Um, who plays Jack Torrance, uh, Johnny, oh, plays Jack Torrance, who comes to the elegant, isolated Overlook Hotel as off-season uh, caretaker with his wife, Shelley Duvall, she does not get a quote, and son, Danny Lloyd, he also does not get a quote. Uh, Torrance has never been there before, or has he? Question mark. Uh, the answer lies in a ghostly time warp of madness and murder. So the only problem that I really have with the miniseries is the CGI is awful. Um, the CG around that time, kind of like for the Langoliers, 
also really sucked. Um, that kind of takes you completely out of the out of the miniseries. So as iconic as the um, like the head like the maze is in this, it should have been better with the animals like the like the uh, hedge animals like the plant animals um, that were CGI. If they were to remake this today, I don't know who you would cast as Jack Torrance. Um, Steven Weber plays him in, in the uh, in the miniseries. I think, think he does a really good job. Um, maybe get an unknown and surround him, you know, with other known people. But I would include the stuff that's missing from the book. Um, there is a short story that King wrote about a mobster um, that is killed at the at the hotel. There's just certain things missing as the novel was so big. Um, I wish that King would re-release it, kind of like he did with The Shining. I'm sorry, uh, The Stand. And uh, put those missing things back in it. And maybe that would make it different enough that you could have three different versions that are very different on their own, but still be based on the book. Um, so here you have Jack looking very iconic. You got uh, Shelley Duvall crying like she does throughout the entire movie. Um, there you have little Danny freaking out. Um, here they have got some, uh, it might be Shelley Duvall running outside the Overlook. And then here's uh, Jack and Shelley Duvall there. Uh, people may not know this, but the Overlook is actually two hotels. Uh, the inside and the outside are, I believe, two different hotels. Um, I think a lot of people think it's just one hotel. Um, let's take a look inside. Okay, so these are nice. I like that picture of The Shining. They give it the good, once again, putting Stanley Kubrick. They're not going to get away from that. Uh, the Shining, you got little Danny there on his on like his big wheel thing. I like the, the colors on it, like that this is a little more empty on the side. So th this is a good picture on the disc. And then that definitely looks like Shelley Duvall. She's got the knife and everything in her hand. And this is good too. So they, they did two good discs. I'm glad that they're actually separate. And that they're just not all pressed on the one, one DVD. So, yeah, I like The Shining, but I think the miniseries is better. But, you know, I like different things than other people do. I did not like very much Spider-Man No Way Home. I thought it was poorly written. But um, I really enjoyed Matrix Resurrections. I thought that was very well written. There appears to be a uh, a cat right over there. Kitty should not be up there. Um, the next one is continuing with The Shining, and it is Doctor Sleep, uh, which I thought was great. Um, this is a Mike Flanagan film. Mike Flanagan right now is my favorite director. Um, he also did Midnight Mass and Haunting of Hill House and all that type of stuff, Haunting of uh, Bly Manor. The Oculus, I mean, to me, just cannot do wrong. Uh, so I thought Dr. Sleep was really good. I highly recommend the director's cut. Don't bother with the theatrical cut. Get the director's cut. This is a combination of, and I like that Stephen King um, signed off on it, okay, that uh, it's a combination of the book Dr. Sleep, the book The Shining, and this version of The Shining. So in the book for The Shining, the Overlook Hotel explodes at the end. The boiler room explodes. In this, you know, the, the Overlook is still there. Jack dies and becomes like a ghost, you know, at the Overlook. So this kind of combines all of that. So in this, the, the hotel is not blown up. But in the book for this, I believe the whole, that the hotel is, and he goes back to remains. So um, I think that Mike Flanagan did a great job on adapting this, um, basically taking like three source materials and making one film. Um, it is certified fresh from Rotten Tomatoes, if you go by them. Um, it says, uh, uh, you know, Ewan McGregor, I think, does a good job as Danny. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson, that's her right there. Um, Stephen King's Dr. Sleep. So obviously he approves it. He let his name be on it. Uh, the next chapter in The Shining Story. Um, I heard that they want to do a part three to this, but who knows? Um, this failed in the box office, unfortunately. 
And I have not heard if it has any sort of cult status or anything on Blu-ray or streaming or anything like that. Um, it says director's cut and theatrical version on Blu-ray discs and via digital movie code. Um, I thought they did a great job with the actors that they got, like the actors that they got to play Shelley Duvall's character. Um, I think, it, you know, they um, just all, when they tried to basically bring back the characters from the first film with different actors, I thought they did a very good job. Um, they really tried hard to, to make that happen. And uh, this is a Blu-ray plus uh, digital code. And I have to redeem the code by 331 2021, so it has expired. There's the side, got the back. There we go, oops, in case it's well enough. Um, so let's see, so what we have on, let's see, the review is scary and uh, mesmerizing. That is from Eric Eisenberg, very tiny. Uh, cinema blend the special features um from shining to sleep author stephen king and director screenwriter mac mike flanagan look back at the original novel and classic film to discuss how they took on the sequel uh the making of dr sleep a new version and return to the overlook um there's ewan mcgregor who of course is looking in the mirror and he sees that murder is red rum let's come back um here we have uh two of the two of the bad people uh there we have ewan mcgregor walking around and then ewan mcgregor and then like a young woman who has the same powers as he has the shining or the shine uh this tells you how to set up the whole code thing to watch the movie uh the film is rated r director's version is uh so here so theatrical version is 152 minutes the director's cut is 180. That is a big difference. So you need to see the, the director's cut. I highly recommend that. Uh, it is rated R and is rated R for uh, disturbing and violent content, some bloody images, language, nudity, and drug use. Got me there. I'm sold. Uh, let's see. This describes how to play the movie. Uh... Yeah, a lot of stuff about the uh, about the digital part of it. Uh, let's see. Uh, still scared by the trauma he endured as a child at the Overlook Hotel, Danny Torrance faces the ghost of his past when he meets Abra, a courageous teen. That's her. Her. Uh, a courageous teen who desperately needs his help and who possesses a powerful um, extrasensory ability called the shine. And for those of you who don't know, Stephen King got the idea for The Shining and The Shine from John Lennon. So um, in one of John Lennon's songs, uh, uh, the lyrics is we all shine on. And um, that's where he got it from, is from John Lennon, which is pretty cool. Um, take off its case, pretty much the same thing. Same back. And then it's got its, you know, how to download the movie. Mm, AR experience. And then here's the director's cut and the theatrical cut. Very boring. At least they're different colors. But look at all that wasted space. Such a waste. Okay. So that wraps up The Shining. Technically, I do have three versions, um, of, or two versions of The Shining if you don't count Dr. Slate. I also own the mini series, but that's on the third video. Um, our next one is more or less all the same story, but I have a few DVDs and Blu-rays on them. So um, 
I would love to make one of these if I could. I, I, I have been a fan of this series since the very first movie came out. And um, I even wrote a treatment for a sequel um, to one of the mini sequels that are on here. And um, I, I would just love to make one of these films. Uh, but I, I don't think that that's ever going to, to happen uh, just because of the state of the movie, you know, the copyrights and stuff like that. Um, but it's one of my favorites. There is a brand new one made that hasn't come out yet. Don't know what's going on with that. I think it played in like one theater, one or two theaters. Um, but it is out there. It's, nobody knows what's going on with it. They all seem to get stuck in limbo for a while. And that is Children of the Corn. So this is the first film. There is a short movie that had to change its name um, that was originally called Children of the Corn. And that's when it was part of the Dollar Babies um, that Stephen King would let you, you know, basically you give them a buck, you can make the short film into a, into a film, into like a short film. Uh, they had to change the title to Disciples of the Crow. Um, I think you can find that on YouTube. Um, it's actually not bad. It's pretty good. Um, and they had to change the title because of this. So um, now it went into, you can't do a dollar baby anymore on this film. Um, this is obviously the Blu-ray of the first film. And um, it is beyond high definition. It's got Peter, Peter Horton and Linda Hamilton of Terminator fame. Stephen King's Children of the Corn. This is the 25th anniversary edition. Um, this is basically before he started taking his name off stuff. So a lot of these do say Stephen King's, even though he didn't appreciate it. I know he's not a fan of this. Um, he's brought it up that he really doesn't want to have anything to do with the Children of the Corn films. <clears throat> I now think he actually bought the rights back, which is probably why that one film, the new one, is stuck in limbo. Um, but I don't know if he doesn't give a shit about the, about the movies, then why buy the rights back? Just let people make them or like one studio, Dimension or whoever it is um make them so i can enjoy them why be a dick so um it says the original that started it all and the poster for this is great which is pretty similar to this and uh immediately i bought this when i saw that they were coming out with it there's the side and this is uh anchor bay there's our back so and it's just got some iconic characters in it and, and names, you know, stuff like Malachi and, you know, all, all that stuff. We, we all know, we all know Chosen of the Corn really from this film. Um, it says the ultimate high definition experience, the original Stephen King shocker, like you've never seen it before. We got a picture of the Hamilton, there's Peter Horton. Um, you know, here we have a couple Children of the Corn kids, like back there, back there, there's one of the the crosses with all the corn on it. And um, yeah, John Franklin, Courtney Jane, uh, Courtney Gaines. Uh, the director of this, who is Fritz. Uh, Kirich? Kirich? Um, he's actually done one of my favorite films, uh, James Spader's first film, Tough Turf. Love Tough Turf. Um, New Line Pictures. I'm sorry. Uh, New World Pictures. Love Tough Turf. Great soundtrack. I just love Tough Turf. James Spader plays the good guy in it. Then he went off to go do um, The New Kids for uh, Sean Cunningham, Sean, Sean S. Cunningham, where he plays the villain. And then doesn't play a nice guy in Pretty in Pink either. Um, so let's see. The, if this is color, it's 92 minutes, rated R. It is widescreen, it's 1080p. And Jonathan Ellis does the music in this. I think he does a good job. George Goldsmith does the screen, you know, has a screenplay. So it says, um, the original Stephen King classic is back now with three all new features. Um, Yes, because that is, it's the audio commentary with the director and the producer and actors, John Franklin and Courtney Gaines. Um, fast film facts. This is uh, also, so this is new. 
So the audio commentary may not be new, but new. Welcome to Gatlin, the sights and sounds of Children of the Corn, an interview with production with the production designer and composer. This is also new. Um, it was the 80s, a new interview with Linda Hamilton, also new. Stephen King on a shoestring, an interview with the producer. Yeah, so those are our three new ones. And they kind of like what Screen Factory does. They put new in capital letters next to the new stuff. Um, uh, then Harvesting Horror, Children of the Corn, a documentary featuring interviews with the director and actors, John Franklin and Courtney Gaines. Theatrical trailer, original storyboard art, uh, poster and still gallery, um, original title sequence art. Um, my big problem with this is that it does follow, follow the short story and it doesn't. Um, I, I'm not going to, I mean, obviously, if you haven't seen this by now, because it's so freaking old, I mean, it's, when this came out, it was already 25 years old. So if you haven't seen this, all right, I'm just going to spoil the ending. It has a happy ending. Um, you know, they drive away with, I think, a couple of the kids in their car and it's a happy ending. Um, that is not the short story. Uh, so, you know, to flush out a short story into a feature film, they did a pretty good job, except that ending is a little, a little too happy for what the short story is. Um, let's see, what does it say? Uh, 25 years after its original release, it remains one of the top shockers of the 80s and perhaps the most popular Stephen King story adaption ever. Um, everything is alive in the cornfields of desolate, of desolate Gatlin, of Nebraska, and the town's children will do anything to protect its, hor its horrific secret. He who walks behind the rose. But when a traveling couple, Peter Horton of 30-something, and pre-Terminator Linda Hamilton are taken... I like that they do that. They just don't say, oh, and Terminator, they're Linda Hamilton. They're actually saying, oh, this is before she did Terminator. Are taken prisoner by the killer kid cult their battle for survival will unleash the most unholy sacrifice of all. The day that Isaac, oh yeah, Isaac, I was blanking on his name for a second, Isaac, so John Franklin is Isaac, um, Malachi, he who walks behind the rose and millions of Children of the Corn fans have been waiting uh, for has finally arrived. The, oh, just a period. No exclamation point. I'm surprised there's no exclamation point there. The original Children of the Corn is back, now in Blu-ray and loaded with exclusive new bonus features. There's our exclamation point. So I'm happy with this disc because I still think this is the, the best one um, out of all of them. But we're not going to do that because at, uh, at some point, um, I am going to do a, a, a ranking and review of all the Children of the Corn films. So... Um, yeah. So I said, yeah, but I will say this is my favorite one. And I'll go that far. Yeah, boring. It's just. So the next one is still staying in Children of the Corn Country, um, a collection. I was very happy to find this collection. Oh my God, was I happy to find this collection. It is the Children of the Corn Collection. And it has, it's a six film set and it's a uh, Miramax classics. Uh, this is one of the Children of the Corn that's from part three. And um, I guess it represents the film, so it's, it's fine, whatever. And then it's, uh, this is um, Echo Bridge. Yep, Echo Bridge. And then we got its back. And it says on top, the Children of the Corn collection, it lists all the films, it gives a brief synopsis, and then it gives credits for each movie all the way down. And um, this goes from, here's a part two, Children of the Corn 2, The Final Sacrifice, Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest, um, Children of the Corn 4, The Gathering, um, then Children of the Corn 5, Field of Terror, Fields of Terror, 
Children of the Corn 666, Isaac's Return, and then Children of the Corn 7, Revelation. And then that was the last one made at the time of this release. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I have to own this. So, yeah, so that's... So let's, ugh. at least the synopses are short. So let's see here. Um, Children of the Corn 2, The Final Sacrifice. When a tabloid reporter and his son travel to a quiet Midwestern town to investigate a gruesome massacre, they fall victim to a possessed orphan named Malachi. Oh, I'm sorry, name, oh, no, not Mal Malachi. Oh, it is Malachi. No. No, Malachi's not in this one. Uh, what am I looking at here? Oh, Mika? A possessed orphan, orphan named Mika. Yeah, because each film, like a different kid is, is taking over them. Um, Malachi never comes back, but Isaac comes back in, in part six. So that one's directed by David F. Pierce. And... Let's take a quick. Yeah, I don't see anybody of that I recognize. Uh, Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest. This one I like because I, I like this because it is a sequel to the first film, but I do like the third one because it, it goes to the big city. So I like that. You know, I like taking something from its original place and then putting it into a completely different place, I think is, is always fun. Um, so Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest, after a couple adopts a pair of orphaned brothers, it becomes alarmingly clear the boys are much more than they seem. Oh, Children of the Corn 2, 94 minutes color, rated R for horror, violence, and language. And then Children of the Corn 3, 91 minutes color, widescreen, rated R for horror, violence, and gore, and for language. Uh, Children of the Corn 3 is directed by James D.R. Um, Hickox. Um, and let's see if it, yeah, don't recognize. Yep, they'll recognize anybody in there. Uh, Children of the Corn 2. I keep finding little things. Uh, Children of the Corn 2 did come out in 1992. When did the original... And people don't like putting dates. Nineteen eighty-four. I knew it was somewhere in the eighties. So wow. So it took a while to get a uh, get a sequel. Eighty eighty-four, and then part two is ninety-two. Um. Okay. So then after that is Children of the Corn four, The Gathering, and it is let's see a bright young medical student must solve the frightening mystery that plagues the children of a small Midwestern town. I've always kind of questioned if this was actually, if part four was even a Children of the Corn film when it came out, and they just kind of slapped the name on it because it just, it really has nothing to do with any of the other movies. Um, it does star uh, Naomi Watts in one of her first films. Um, it's directed by Greg Spence. Um... 85 minutes, color, widescreen, rated R for strong horror violence and gore and for some language. Came out in 96. So I guess part three did really well on video. So they just immediately, you know, brought out part four. Uh, now part five, Children of the Corn 5, Fields of Terror. Six college students take a wrong turn and find themselves lost in a strangely deserted rural town, dot, 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 only to discover that this quiet place hides a murderous cult of children. 
So I, I do believe that all of them were children of the corn films, except I don't know about part four. I, I still think that one had the name slept on it, but I could be wrong. Um, let's see. So it's directed by um, Ethan Wiley, who did like House 2, the second story. It does star um, um, Alexis Arquette, who has passed away. He's in it. Um, Afmet Zappa, related to a Zappa, maybe. Um, Fred Williamson and David Carradine as Luke. I do like this one. It's probably one of my favorite ones. Uh, 1998. So two years later, they brought they brought this one out. Uh, Children of the Corn 666, Isaac's Return. Um, on a trip to Gatlin, Nebraska to find her birth mother, Hannah Martin picks up a dark stranger who kicks off a mysterious chain of events. 82 minutes, color, widescreen, rated R for horror, violence, and gore in some language. This one is directed by Kara Oglen, Skoglen. Oh, it's one of the writers on it is John Franklin, who plays, who's Isaac. Anybody else in this? Nancy Allen, John Franklin as Isaac, Stacy Keach. I enjoyed that one. It was nice to see John Franklin back. Uh, then the last one on here is Children of the Corn Seven. Um, I'm blanking on the word. Revelation. Um, see when. When calls to her grandmother, when calls go to her grandmother, go, oh, okay. When calls go to her grandmother unanswered, Jamie Lau, Lowell uncovers the truth behind her mysterious disappearance. Um, 82 minutes, color, widescreen, rated R for language, nudity, violence, terror, and some drug use. So part six was 1999. And part seven is 2001. That's directed by Guy Magar. And Michael Ironside. I think Stephen King just like wanted nothing to do with these. Um, it is Echo Bridge, like I said, but this was at the time through Miramax. I enjoyed all of these. Um, there's the same, Echo Bridge also did one for Hellraiser where it's from part three on. Um, and I think, it, but sadly part three is rated R. There is an uncut version of it out there, <clears throat> which I think is only available on VHS. I don't think it ever became available uncut on DVD, but they did the same type of thing. And as like Pinhead here, same, it says like the Hellraiser collection, that type of thing. I'll be looking at those at another time. Um, yeah, so these are going to be boring. So they have, it's probably like two films on each disc is what it looks like. Oh, okay. So this has Children of the Corn, Children of the Corn 3. So Children of the Corn 2 and 3, it looks like are on this desk, just... Children of the Corn 2 is on A. Children of the Corn 3 is on B. B side. Double-sided disc. And then you got, on this one, at least it's got a freaking picture on it. Children of the Corn 5, 6, and 7 are on this one. I mean, I like this. I like that it's got... And it looks like this came out Echo Bridge 2011. Or at least around there, since this was put into a collection probably from other, yeah, 2011. So that's the collection that I have with Children of the Corn, but we're not done yet. We're almost there. 
Um, this one, I'm only going to get into one film because the other movies I can get into on another video. This is a triple feature, a Dimension Extreme Horror Fest. I was so happy when this came out. I was actually working at Best Buy. Um, I was like a, um, I did a lot of like project, like a, a merchandise projects for them and stuff for about a year. Hated it. Absolutely fucking hated it. But um, this came out. And I grabbed it immediately and purchased it when I could. Um, so this has on it, and they were all new at the time, which was great. So none of these were old. So we have Hellraiser. Um, um, I'm blanking on it again. Relevations. With the pinhead that everybody hates. I, I like this movie. I don't care what people say. I like it. And I'll get into that when uh, when I do my whole video just on Hellraiser. Um, it does have Children of the Corn Genesis, which is the one that we'll be talking about. And Zombie Diaries 2, World of the Dead. All sequels. Um, Dimension, like I said, Dimension Extreme Horror Fest. Triple feature. And um, yeah, brought out through Dimension. Here's its side. And got its back. And so saying that these are widescreen, the total running time is 258. So 258 minutes color. Um, the return of Pinhead. And then there he is there. The Pinhead that nobody likes. I like him. And I have my reasons, and I'll explain that when I do the video. Uh, deleted, uh, let's see, special features are deleted scenes. Uh, the film is rated R uh, for bloody horror, violence, grisly images, sexual content, and language. Um, so let's see, the return of Pinhead. Uh, Pinhead is back in, the, in this next chilling chapter of the, of the ever popular Hellraiser series created by horror master Clyde Barker. Two American teenagers in Mexico, two American teenagers in Mexico for a little adventure, discover a familiar puzzle box and unleash Pinhead and unspeakable terror. A year later, the boy's parents are gathered for a dinner in memory of their missing sons. Oh, I'm not supposed to be reading this yet because we're, we're doing Children of the Corn. Well, I'll just finish it. Um, oh, what the fuck? I'll just read all three. Um, a year later, okay, but uh, uh, missing sense. Um, in the dead of night, one of the boys shows up at their doorstep, exhausted, terrified, and dot 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 hunted. Uh, Pinhead and his legion are closing in. Yeah, so now for the um, for this one here, Zombie Diaries 2, World of the Dead. I recommend this also. I also recommend the first film. And um, it's special features. It's an in-depth look at the making of Zombie Diaries 2. It is rated R. Uh, violence and gore, a rape, language, some sexual content, a brief nudity. Uh, let's see, Journey into Zombie Hell. Three months have passed since the viral outbreak wiped out 99.9% .9 of the world's population turning its victims into flesh-eating living dead. A small band of British survivors have taken refuge at a military barracks. Life is tough and brutal, but hope arrives when they receive a high-level communication telling them of a sanctuary somewhere in Europe, dot, 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 but it is true or a trap, or is it, but is it true or a trap, question mark. Um, witnesses, witnesses a desperate battle for survival in the terrifying sequel to the best-selling The Zombie Diaries. All right, so even though those have nothing to do with my Children of the Corn films, fuck it, I'll just read it. Um, so now for The Children of the Corn. That's in the middle. <coughs> um, the next chapter in terror. Uh, this is a, uh, the special features with director Joel um, Sass Sassoon. Sassoon? Sison, I can't tell if that's an O. I think it's an O I. Sison, Joel Sasson. 
Um, rated R, horror, violence, language, and some sexual content. So this, it's, it's kind of like actually a prequel, kind of like how it all started in a way. Uh, let's see. Genesis is the chilling next chapter in the ever popular horror series based on the classic King's story. When a stranded young couple seek refuge in a remote desert compound, they encounter a strange Manson-like figure known as Preacher Billy Drago. Oh, Billy Drago, The Untouchables. Um, he recently, he reluctantly allows them inside with orders to be gone, to be gone. Oh, they put gone and by as one word. Okay. To be gone by morning while investigating faint screams coming from a dilapidated shed, the couple discover they have stumbled upon a bizarre cult worshiping an entity that may or may not dwell inside the haunted little boy. I enjoyed it. It wasn't perfect, but I liked it. Um, so, oh, this, okay, yeah. So each one, which is, this is a pretty heavy, which is nice. So this is on the disc by itself. It's got a good cover on it. I mean, it's just the front, but it's got, you know, it's nice looking at least. Um, here's Children of the, yeah, same thing, except they cut off his weapon. And then Zombie Diaries 2, where it has a hole in the hand. So that's kind of cool. They put the hole right there where the bullet went through the zombie's hand. So they're all on their own discs, which is nice. That's how it should be. This is a great collection. Pick it up. I mean, really good collection. I was really happy with this. Um, so we got two left. Still Children of the Core, because they made so damn many Children of the Corn films. This one I really like, except they got the couple fighting and the girl and the, uh, I guess it's the wife. Oh my God, she is so horrible in this film. It, it's hard to watch because she's, she's so bitchy. She's such a horrible person. And, and the guy is, is kind of, he's not, he's really kind of a beta, but um, cause he just lets her just beat him down. But uh, I enjoyed it. Um, it's the TV movie that was made of Children of the Corn. So it's the, an actual remake of the original Children of the Corn. From what I understand, it is taken from the actual script that Stephen King wrote way back in the day. And they asked him if he would like to be involved in this version because it is his script. And he went, fuck no. And uh, so they went off and just did it themselves. Um, this is an interesting version of the film. And, uh, but this is also the uncut and uncensored because it originally came out on TV. Um, I like this because it does have its slip jacket. And uh, it does say based upon the short story by Stephen King. So there's the new, um, I think that's Malachi back there. There's Isaac. And uh, it's a good cover. I like the cover. The children I remember being in this are a little more bland than they are in the original movie. Um, the husband that is in this, um, I believe this takes place right after Vietnam or like he comes back from Vietnam. And when he's going around the cornfield, he sees that as being in Vietnam and the kids are the Vietnamese. So he starts killing the kids because he thinks that he's fighting like the Viet Cong. And, uh, I thought that was great. I thought that was hilarious. Um, I don't remember if that's in the short story or not. I don't think it is, but I really like that part. And here's the side. Um, here's its back. And this is Anchor Bay. So this is the two couples right here. She is probably a, like a really nice person in, in real life and, and a good actress. But man, is she, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, she is a horrible human being. She is such a bitch in this movie that I, I, I don't know why he would be with her, except that he's just not strong enough to break away. And she just likes to torture him. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, wow. And uh, yeah, so it says uh, a rebirth of the horror classic, now totally uncut and uncensored. Uh, the special features are new directions and interview with writer, producer, director, Donald P. 
broachers on remaking a cult classic. Uh, cast of the Corn interviews with the uh, with the two actors. Um, because they would well, see the actors, um, Kanzi McClure, she plays Vicky, and David Anders plays Bert, and then also Daniel Newman, who plays Man- Malachi. Um, to Live and Die in Gatlin interviews with the production designer and the special effects supervisor. And fly on the wall behind the scenes footage from the set of Children of the Corn. I do like this back. I like that they're next to their car here and you just got the kids' shadows and there's like Isaac right there. Um, we got some pictures here. So there's our, our I'm guessing that is uh, David Anders. David Anders with the kids. Oh, that's also um, Kanzi McClure is also there too. She's a little off to the side. Um, Malachi by a damaged car and then the children of the corn beating somebody. Um, yeah, because it says screenplay by the director. So screenplay by David B. Um, Brochers and Stephen King. So they got the word and. So they took his, Stephen King's original script and then just rewrote it for, for this. But like I said, I heard that um, yeah, that King didn't want anything to do with this, which was unfortunate. Uh, the music is by uh, Jonathan Ellis, who did the music from the first film. And um, it's also based on his music. Uh, color, 92 minutes, not rated. Widescreen. So, 2009. Oh, this was made for stars. The channel stars. But Anchor Bay released it. So let's see. Um, now totally uncut and uncensored. From David B. Brochers comes the resurrection of the most unholy shocker of its time. It's 1975. So yeah, so Vietnam. And a young married couple, Vietnam vet Bert David Anders of Alias and Heroes, and Preacher's daughter, Vicky, um, Candice, Candice uh, McClure of, of Battlestar Galactica, are driving cross-country straight into the heartland of hell. Here in Gatlin, Nebraska, the town's bloodthirsty children, led by boy preacher Isaac and his teen enforcer, Malachi, have slaughtered all adults by command of he who walks behind the rose. Now, two new outlanders have arrived, dot, 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 and the time of sacrifice is at hand. Uh, Preston Bailey, Dexter, and Daniel Newman co-star in this brutal and chilling reimagining of King's infamous tale featuring graphic footage not shown in the TV broadcast. <coughs> so I like this. I like this version of it, but man, I'm telling you, she is just, she is brutal. I mean, that, that makes it a little hard to watch, but I think she did too good of a job. Um, so, I mean, good for her, uh, but they, they probably should have toned it down just a little bit. Um, so let's take the slip jacket off. Yeah, it looks like it's the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. And we'll go inside. Nice and boring. And it's got the box I hate. Dull, dull, dull. All right. We are now on the last film. And this is the last Children of the Four, Children of the Corn to come out. I really enjoyed it. Um, I am a fan of John Gulger. I enjoyed Feast one through three. Um, he's done little acting bits that I like. And he did um. I guess, you know, the most recent Children of the Corn film, Children of the Corn Runaway. I'm not a big fan of just Runaway as the subtitle, uh, but whatever. Um, this is the Blu-ray digital based on the story uh, Children of the Corn by Stephen King. Um, so there we have a bunch of corn. There we have a little girl. And um, she might be the runaway. Uh, it does have a slip jacket, which is nice. 
This also took a long time to come out. For a while, it was just people just showing pictures, um, mostly behind the scenes, and then they had some, you know, actual pictures. But man, this thing took a couple of years to come out, and I was happy that it was good. Um, I think uh, John Gulliger is, in, and that's Clue Gulliger's son. Um, he should get more directing jobs. I don't know why he doesn't. Um, if you've seen Project Greenlight with him with Feast, um, maybe it's just too too much for him. I don't know. But I think he's a good director, and he should do, and he should do more. He's very underrated. Uh, there's its side, and it's back. Um, this is Lionsgate, who released this um, special feature deleted scene. So I guess just one deleted scene. Um, there looks to be a scarecrow back there with a scary woman right there. I watched this a long time ago, so I'm not sure who that is. Um, here we have a, a waitress. Um, this might be the, the evil daughter type of thing. Um, here we have, looks like it might be this person running. And then we have uh, two, two kids here. So, so I, I think what it is is that it's a, if I remember correctly, one of the girls from like the corn, from the children of the corn, the cult, um, she is pregnant and she runs. Like, I think maybe she's hit that age or something. She's pregnant and she leaves. And then I believe this. And they can't find her. Many, 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 many years later. So I think it's her grown up. She has the kid who's this kid here. And then the children come looking for her. Um, I think that's correct. Um, this also has the, the, yeah, the digital, so it shows you how to do the digital here. It is not rated. It is Dimension Films, Lionsgate, uh, 1080p. It is widescreen. Uh, we got its audio. We got its subtitles. It runs 82 minutes, and this is from 2018. So not that old, but um, they were, for Children of the Corn and for um, Hellraiser, it became a copyright issue. So every 10 years, they would make another Hellraiser or Children of the Corn, this is Dimension, to hold on to the rights. So the newest Hellraiser, Judgment, was that same way. So was this. They were made around the same time. Um, does this... So this is 2009, but it's not Dimension. And this is 2018, so roughly. So they probably had to make one or else they would lose the rights. I think they probably, it seems like maybe Stars or Anchor Bay bought the rights to the first movie to remake it, but they still had the rights to, you know, Dimension to make sequels. Um, so let's see. So let, let's uh, see if I'm right in my me remembering the story of this. Children of the Corn Runaway tells the story of young pregnant Ruth who escapes a murderous child cult in a small Midwestern town. She spends the next decade living anonymously in an attempt to spare her son the horrors that she experienced as a, as a child. Oh, she has a son. <coughs> so that's not her. This may be the girl. So this, this may be like the female you know, like uh, um, Isaac or Malachi. So maybe it's a girl that comes after that. Um, the horrors that she experienced as a child. Ruth and her son end up in a small Oklahoma town, but something is following her. Now she must confront this evil or lose her child. So yeah, I think like the kid gets involved with her, like they become friends or something, but she's actually evil. She's part of the cult. Um, no credits or anything on this. So let's let's see what it looks like under here. Okay, here we go. So, front is the same, but the back has, so same pictures. Yeah, still tells you how to use the digital, but it does have credits. So, Dimension Films, um, no actors I recognize. Edited by John Gulliger. Directed by John Gulliger. Screenplay is done by the same guy 
who did Genesis. That Joel um, Session. And it says based on the short story by Stephen King. I, I think at this point, this is where King was getting tired of, of things saying based on a story by Stephen King when it has like nothing to do with the story. And that's why he wanted to get the, uh, the rights back to, to certain movies. Um, this is, I think I already, yeah, so I already went over like it's running time and stuff. So I mean, just use a different picture. Got a whole movie that you could just grab a screenshot from. So, all right. That is it. That is all of these. That was exhaustive. Exhausting. Exhaustive. Um, all right. So let's recap. And then I can let you all go. Um, so once again, we start with what we just looked at. So here we have a Children of the Corn Runaway. I recommend it. Blu-ray. Looks good. John Gulger. Um, The remake of Children of the Corn. I also recommend. Oh, and this has the ending of the, of the short story. This does not have a happy ending. So I, that, that's probably why I like this one. I don't know. God, maybe I like the first one, the very first one, and this one equally. Because this represents the short story better. But I think The Children of the Corn, the very first one, with Linda Hamilton, might be just a better movie. Um, so hmm, might be a tie. I don't know. But once again, I said I wasn't going to talk about this stuff. Um, then we got uh, Children of the Corn Genesis. This is a great triple feature. So, you know, pick it up if you can find it. Then the Children of the Corn Collection, six movies. Definitely pick this up if you're a fan. Um, it goes through part two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Definitely worth picking up. Of course, the original Children of the Corn on Blu-ray, definitely pick that up if you're a fan. It's got some good bonus stuff on it. Looks really good. Still a classic. Uh, then we got uh, the sequel to The Shining, Doctor Sleep. Definitely pick it up on Blu-ray. Watch that director's cut. Um, the Shining, still a good movie, even though I think the miniseries is better. This is a great, you know, two-disc special edition. So, um, I would probably, I would say pick it up on Blu-ray actually, but um, I happen to find this. So eventually I'll pick it up on Blu-ray because it's so visually nice looking and it's just a beautiful looking movie. But, uh, but yeah, definitely pick. And I think the Blu-ray actually has everything that's on this, on it too. So it's just on one disc instead of two. Uh, we then have Lawnmower Man 2, Jobs War. Jobs War. One of the worst movies ever made. If you want to have a good time getting drunk or high and watch a movie, watch this one and then pop in Highlander 2. Uh, then we have the, steam, the film that Stephen King had his name removed from and sued the company, Lawnmower Man. Uh, trucks, based on the short story, Trucks. And of course, Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive, one of the greatest bad movies ever made. This is a must, an absolute must. And then we have the mini versions of Carrie. So here you have the three collection version of Carrie with the original 1976 version, the Rage Carrie 2, and then the, uh, the TV movie from 2002 of Carrie. So this is good if you like Carrie, pick them all up. You're only just missing that, that brand new one. And speaking of the brand new one, here we have the Blu-ray, the Carrie two pack that has the original film and the new movie in it. So that's worth picking up too. I did like this version. I just don't think we need that uncut version. And she's just, yeah, it, it was fine, but it's, it's, yeah, it needs that extra thing in there. Um, I did show you the, the slip cover, the extra slip cover that Screen Factory gives out. And then Carrie itself the original movie from Scream Factory with all of its special features. So this is an absolute must to pick up from them if you're a fan. 
All right, that is it. And I'm gonna put these nicely right here. There we go. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. And um, we got one more video to go on this. Um, I don't think that will be as long as this video because there were so many on this one. But um, yeah, that's it. So thank you very much. I really do appreciate you watching these videos. I hope that you like them. And I will see you on the next one. All right, bye. Hey everybody, thanks for hanging out after the video and uh, thank you for watching the very first Dark Park Films sponsored video. And who is that sponsor? Well, I've now learned if I do this with my hands, they go to the right area. There we go. That would be Wildlife Command Center Coffee and you can purchase it right there. You can go to their website, which is uh, buywcc.com and pick up their coffee. Uh, they have uh, two blends, which I'm going to show you now. Um, the first coffee is this one right here. Uh, this is a breakfast blend. It's 10 ounces and it is a medium ground. Um, and it does say, and it's breakfast, like I said, and this is what it says right here. It says, uh, early bird can catch the worm. So there you go, a breakfast blend coffee that helps you catch the worm in the morning. And um, I really like this one. I'm more of a, a, a breakfast kind of blend coffee guy in the morning. Um, so this one I, I really like. Um, it has that little bit of oomph to it to kind of get you moving, uh, you know, get you up and out. And uh, so I really enjoy this one, but that doesn't mean that I don't like the other one, which is this one right here. Uh, this is a dark roast. It is also 10 ounces. And both of these are $7.99 at their website. Pretty good price for 10 ounces worth of ground coffee. Um, this one is, um, it's a little darker. So it's, you know, I think it's better for drinking at night. Maybe if you're you know, writing a screenplay, or if you're filming, uh, this has got that oomph oomph, that double punch to, to get you going. So um, this is one that I also recommend. I like both of these quite a bit, uh, but I, I kind of do, you know, the breakfast in the morning and then the dark more at night. Um, so I recommend both of these quite a bit. And um, how did I find out about these two, you know, uh, these two coffees here? And how did I find out about uh, Wildlife uh, Command Center? Well, when I was working um, on uh, Night of the Zom Ghouls, there was a box of coffee that was just sitting there, filled with coffee. And we didn't know what to do with it. Like, whose is this? Who brought it? Why, why is it here? And so we just kept going to the store and buying coffee. And then one day I said, why don't we just get the coffee out of the box and use that instead of you know wasting money on going to Smith's or whatever and, and picking up coffee. So we did. Uh, we did not realize that it was um, the Wildlife Command Center coffee and uh, that it you know, was sponsoring the movie. And it was great coffee. Everybody loved it. And we just went right through it. By the last day of filming, this coffee was gone. And uh, I went and found out you know, about Wildlife Command Center asked if they would like to be a sponsor for Dark Park Films, you know, for their coffee. Um, as many of you know, I love coffee. I love coffee mugs. And so this was a perfect match. And Wildlife Command Center is great with animals. So they provide a great service for rescuing animals. So it's kind of that double whammy for me where coffee, helping animals, you can't go wrong. And they were even cool enough to send me get in there, a coffee mug, because they knew that I liked coffee mugs. And right now, I don't get that, oh, 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 a little bit, I'm gonna go on the keyboard, but there's their, that's their uh, dark blend because I'm recording this at night. So I am, I am actually drinking that while recording. Um, also one thing that you can get at their website, which is cool, is you can get this, there you go, this pocket knife. 
uh, which is 949. And um, this is pretty cool because it has their name on it. Uh, you know, Wildlife Command Center, we can catch it. And this is what it looks like. Put that down there. There we go. Fully, fully out. So you're getting like the bottle opener, you got the corkscrew, you got a screwdriver, you got a blade, and then you got this little hook thing that you can pop it into something that doesn't have a tab, and then um, you know the liquid or whatever in there will come out. So this is pretty cool. And um, I'm just gonna keep mine in my car because you never know, you might need a pocket knife. So um, please support them. I'm gonna have links down below. Uh, you know, where you can, you know, check out just the uh, Wildlife Command Center. Um, I'll also have a link for Wildlife Command Center Coffee. And um, it will basically be for uh, both these guys right here. And uh, please support them. Um, I support them. I think what they do is pretty awesome. And, um, you know, maybe this coffee will, will be on your set or in your kitchen. It will definitely be, you know, on my set in my kitchen, I know that. So uh, please, once again, I'm gonna show you these. Please go to their, their website and uh, pick up their coffee and make it, uh, make it part of your day or night, depending on which one you, which one you like. So uh, that'll be about it. I really appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with me. And uh, yeah, so thank you. And uh, once again, please, uh, please support, uh, my channel, please support uh, the Wildlife Command Center, and I will catch you later. Bye.